I'll now invite questions. I'll invite questions from members of the audience. I would like you, if you wouldn't mind, to come up to this mic, please, because if you don't, your question will not be recorded on our video, which will be on our site, but we'd like you to be recorded. And uh, I'll just take one question at a time. You raised your hand. I acknowledge you. I'm very fair-minded. I promise to acknowledge you. There's lots of time, so let's start. Who is the first question? Front, yes, please. And who would you be directing your question to? Malcolm Roberts. Malcolm, come on. Malcolm, you told us about the illustrious organisation, the United Nations Accommodate Deal, <laughs> which is true. It's true. And I'd like you to tell the people how many, how much byproducts are in coal and how, how it's made us wealthy. And you can show them some of the treaties that we've signed. You'll, you'll cough in your rompers when you see how many there are and what they've done to the place and the Lima Declaration. It's all in there. Just get the light out. That's a Dorothy Dix question, of course. Um, <laughs> but these are some of the over 7,000 treaties that this country has signed, that we've signed. Our representatives have signed. Did you hear about many of them? No. Did you hear about UN Agenda 21? No. Neither did I. And so, there's some of the documents that we are now being governed by. But we can tell them all to go to hell. We can pull out. So that's what needs to be done. The second point you mentioned, John, about the first point you mentioned, sorry? How many bottles? Oh, coal. Coal. And how much? Every single thing in this room, every single thing that you can see, that we can see, is a result of coal. Either directly, as in most cases, or indirectly. Printing ink in the books. Clothing. Whether it be the cotton that was harvested, or the nylon or synthetics that were actually made from coal directly. They were transported here. They were harvested, they were grown by mechanical implements made out of steel that, was that, was, that needed coal to be made. Our food is transported with coal. Our lights are now generated by coal. It's fundamental. Fundamental. We've got Tomago, we've got Tomago smelter and Curry Curry smelter. I lived in Curry Curry in the Hunter Valley when that smelter was built. It's shut. The Tomago one is about to shut, I believe. Why did those smelters come to the Hunter Valley and provide so many jobs? Cheap electricity from abundant, high quality, clean coal. Gone. What's replacing it? Doctors, unemployment figures. Young people without jobs. That's why we need to fix the tax system and we need to start telling the truth about energy. Because the fact is that renewables, they're called alternative energies. They're actually alternatives to energy. That's what's happening and our politicians of both main parties, led by the Greens, are telling us it's in the name of saving the planet, yet there's no evidence for that. And the evidence, the empirical evidence that decides science says we are not affecting climate anyway. Now we all thought the United Nations was the policeman and the good men of the world. Now the most powerful men in the United Nations, the Under Secretary General to the Secretary General, who's in control of all United Nations armaments, all United Nations military equipment, including all nuclear weapons. Now you recall the Cold War from the fifth after the Second World War right up and the, and the baddies are over there with all their rockets and everything else? And we're, and we're going to fight them, we're going to get to the moon first, and we're going to do this because of the, 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 the Russians are the baddies. Well, guess who's been the most powerful man in the United Nations? I just told you, in control of all the United Nations weapons. 46 to 49, Agadev Shoblin, ain't Irish. 49 to 53, Konstantin Zinzenko. 53 to 54, Ilyov Trudovsky. 57 to 54 to 57, David Lopatovich. It goes right down to 83, and they've all been Russians. And we've been fighting the Russians. They said, there's the wall that you can't get out. We're, the, the, everyone, as soon as Russians put a, a parade in the, in the Red Square, half of them were wooden replicas, or the world shattered. That's the United Nations that we've signed up to, destroyed our country with the Lima Declaration, all our industries, and then this thing here, the Agenda 21, that cripples our farmers, and we're the greatest farmers in the world, no one can beat us, 
And that's the United Nations of Melbourne's flag up there. Good evening, everyone. My name's Gary. Um, I'm just my concern, Malcolm, is what you mentioned about the debt. I see uh, Sydney turning into little China and buying up everything. You did say that um, the cost of houses was mainly because of uh, cost of tax and your debt set right. But in my area, 50 China will beat you to a price of a house every time. And the Chinese at the moment, and I'm not picking on them, there's probably other other na national people, they are making so much money overseas, whatever they do, when they come here uh, in their jumbo jets and rear jets, they can buy us out so quick. So I'm really concerned with my grandchildren that in five or six years' time there'll be nothing left that we own, including farms, businesses and whatever, and the debt is increasing. And, and in the business that I'm in as well, I see the government continue to spend. I know they've got to fix a few roads and things, but they're inefficient and they're wasting money. And when they come up with some spare money, even a million dollars, my tip is don't find somewhere to spend that million, put it on the debt and bring the debt down. Thank you for your question. These things, from what I can see, can't be solved with one or two little band-aids and not being disrespectful to you, that's being disrespectful. But it's being truthful about the, the governance of this country for many years. They're patched up with little band-aids of tax to raise a bit more money or something else to take away from people. And if we fixed up the tax system, we would get about $100 billion a year extra revenue without driving any, any companies overseas. That's, that's the first thing. Then we'd be able to balance the books and we'd have a fair tax system that would make it viable for small businesses to start again and viable for people to earn a good living and reduce their cost of living, increase the, the purchasing power of, their, of, of our income. The second thing about foreign investment, we want foreign investment, but we don't want foreign control. And uh, my understanding is the housing market is driven by many complex things but we're told that the Foreign Investment Review Board controls, has controls over the, the uh, purchasing of, of real estate in this country, but we're also told that it's not enforced. So that's something that needs to be fixed. Because what's happening in this country is that there's very low accountability. And the people who are accountable, are in, this, in, in the end result, the, the sovereigns of this country are the people in this room. Yeah. That's it. We are the ones who elect the, the, uh, the representatives and we have a parliamentary democracy which means that the representatives uh, make decisions on behalf of the people we represent. But that doesn't happen very much. And we've now got a plebiscite put forward by the Liberal government. We support a plebiscite on an important issue. Give the people a say. What do the Labour Party want to do? What do the Greens want to do? What does Darren Hinch want to do? What do many of them want to do? They want to shut the people up and they say things like, that's a $150 million opinion poll. Well, we've got news for them. They were put into power by a, an opinion poll. So if they're discrediting the voice of the people through a plebiscite, they are discrediting their own appointment. So I, the other thing we've got to do is get understand our debt, understand our budget, because they're out of control. So that's what we're about. We're about finding out and asking those questions. I can't give you any more general uh, any more specific than that, but that's what we're about. Thank you, Speaker. Um, when I heard you talk about one of your topics for discussion one evening was the growth of hatred in self-hatred in Western countries, it made me think of how we're all made to hate ourselves, really, and to make ourselves feel guilty for having a legitimate concern about the Islam migration problem. Um, and we are labelled Islamophobic and racist. And I think Australia should have um, a lot of respect and be proud of our record in multiculturalism. We embrace every, every country, any culture in the world, who has wanted to come here and integrate and contribute to our society. And I think Australians have had a guttural of being made to feel racist and Islamophobic when the terrible things that we're seeing happening 
I'd like to invite your comments on that. Who, who, Thank who, you. Who would you like to direct that to? Anyone who wants to answer. Anyone who wants to Thank you. Well, we were labelled the anti-Islam party before the election, but um, I find this, I get challenged a lot. I'm on the anti-fascist action uh, website as being a fascist, apparently. Um, what they uh, fail to notice is that um, within a couple of hours of me being endorsed as a candidate, I was also endorsed by a Muslim sultan and his cousin, a prince, because they knew what it was we really stood for, not what the media in Australia wanted to label us as. Um, I sit on the Judicial Council for a foreign head of state who's a Muslim sultan. And um, we look at things in, uh, in his sultanate to do with constitutional issues, to do with uh, diminishing the impact of Sharia law in that sultanate. And so it's a bit of a struggle because he's up against some radicals and um, you know, this is in the southern Philippines where people lose their heads over topics like this. But um, the issue, as it was uh, as it was articulated by the Australian Liberty Alliance in our policy, is that the majority of atrocities and terrorist activities committed in this country were by people who came from OIC countries, OIC being the Organisation of Islamic Cooperation, or their children. So what our policy was, let's stop resident visa applications from those countries, with the exception of Christians, mm -hmm. until we knew what it was we had already. And 10 years was the token amount, and if 10 years wasn't long enough, we extend it. And when we had a handle on who we had living amongst us, then we could decide what to do. Now, there's been some interesting statistics that come out about all of this. In the 2013 election, Tony Abbott made um, some headlines about the disability pension. And people were up in arms, people with their rainbow socks on and whatever, up in arms because he was going to remove benefits from people in wheelchairs. Well, the truth behind that issue was that the disability budget had blown out and had blown out to something like $19 billion over and above what it had been prior to the advent of Muslim migration. Because if you were a Muslim and you went to Centrelink to get unemployment benefits, you automatically got disability. Now, a lot of people will tell you that Islam is a mental illness. And in fact, the media will tell us that. The media will tell us when someone commits an atrocity, it's because they've got a mental health problem. Turns out that coincidentally have uh, uh, Muslims more often than not. But the, what Tony Abbott was trying to do was to get a consensus to attack the issue of the rorting of the disability pension to be able to clean out those who were not entitled. Similarly, <clears throat> this is getting off the topic a little bit and I hope you'll excuse me. There was the issue that Jackie Lambie went to bat about, ex about servicemen's wages. Now, the thing is, what you may not know is that none of the Vietnam veterans have had their pensions linked to the CPI since the end of the Vietnam War. Now, I get a, a service pension and I'm expected to live on it. And of course I do. It's $138 a fortnight. <laughs> yeah, we're rolling, I can tell you. So... The issue was brought up by Jackie Lambie, they're going to cut the servicemen's wages and whatever, when in fact what Tony Abbott was attempting to do was to unseat the Defence People's Group. The Defence People's Group was one of the Dud Dullard, I'm oh, sorry, the Rudd Gillard um, uh, creations. It was staffed by public servants on $400,000 a year plus per annum, and their pure agenda was to get a homosexual person into special forces. Now, I called it the pink camouflage and wheelchair-friendly submarine policy, but what they failed to notice was that there's been homosexual people in special forces since the Dead Sea was only sick. It's just that they didn't talk about it. And what Tony Abbott wanted was the mandate to go and kick these people out of office. All they were doing was sitting on their freckle all day and trying to achieve something that had been achieved already. But it was a jobs for the boys, for the bureaucrats, 
who were looking for high paid positions in Canberra and they were being looked after by their political masters. So the issue with Islamic migration, we've seen the backlash in a lot of other countries in the world. We've seen uh, Yet Wilders um, rise to power in, uh, in the, uh, the Netherlands. We've seen similar things with Marine Le Pen in uh, France. We've seen similar issues in um, AFD, which is uh, Alternative for Deutschland, I think is the correct name, where a lot of these parties, which are tagged as extreme right, uh, are on the rise as people get sick and tired of seeing tragedies like the Nice uh, truck incident, like the, um, the uh, Delhi in Paris and like the um, uh, Charlie Hebdo uh, atrocities. And we're seeing them here in Australia. Two young boys think it's okay to get a couple of bayonets and go and behead someone around near the Bankstown Mosque. The lowest common denominator in all of these atrocities appears to be Islam. Now, it's not saying that all Muslims are bad. It's the ideology that sucks. The ideology is not a religion. It's a many-headed hydra that has a political arm, it has a financial arm, it has a religious arm, it has a social arm. And in fact, we saw in the last budget, there is now to be no impediment for Sharia finance in Australia. And of course, that's the LNP opening the way for Saudi investment in this country. So, you know, as a bunch of people, we control as a, you know, a disparate group of minor party supporters and whatever, we control or we have the power to change a lot of this stuff. And we'll only do it through political change. So I'm not sure if that satisfies your question or not. Yes. I hope so. I'd like to make a few comments because you raised a very important word, guilt. That's what the Greens are doing. They're fermenting guilt at being human. Our kids are being raised with fear and guilt and hate. That's great. The media too. Where did the media come from? A lot of journalists are trained, not only in the ABC but in universities. The, the, um, the control freaks, I won't use the left wing, but control freaks have gone through a long, solid march through all of the institutions of the Western world. And we are producing, um, we're producing clients who can't think. But that guilt is insidious. And guilt eats away at people's spirit. And that's what makes us different as humans, our spirit. And uh, so that's a very important topic. But I wanted to mention a couple of things there. Hate, guilt, fear, and division are the realm of the Greens. That is one of the reasons why they're so dangerous. Another reason is that they suppress speech. So all of these issues we're talking about can't be touched. The other thing that uh, Peter just mentioned about Islam, it is an ideology. The person who the Christians followed, Jesus Christ, didn't tell anyone to go and kill someone when they couldn't be converted to Christianity. He said, forgive them, accept them. And that brings grace, the very opposite of what Islam is preaching. I was raised in a family which had uh, staff around it in India, including Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, Sikhs, and Christians. Our, t our daughter went to a school where there was a Muslim teacher, and she was wonderful. Muslims are fine, many of them. But Islam is the problem. And I was asleep to that until early this year. So I want to also celebrate a couple of things that, um, that Peter mentioned. There's a wonderful man in Queensland by the name of Bernard Gaynor. You know him. And Bernard takes up the challenge to the courts because he is taken into court by an organisation, the state government in this, this state, and he's a Queenslander. So if he says anything in response to an activist in this state, He's taken to court. That's how they capture us, and that's how they shut people down. But they're not shutting Bernard down. Bernard also talks about the destruction of the defence forces because he's a passionate former military man. He served the country loyally. So, um, 
Now think about this. There are more Buddhists in this country than people who follow Islam. Do you hear much about them? <laughs> so, another thing Peter mentioned. Taxpayer-funded public servants. Guess what the University of Queensland Vice-Chancellor has paid? Yes. 750. Do I hear anything else? Million. million. It is. It's just over a million dollars a year. He's a foreigner. And... And he, he permits the misrepresentation of climate science. Permits and encourages it, sir. Yep. But here's this, think about this one. Peter mentioned Tony Abbott. Tony Abbott is a strong climate skeptic. People in the, in the Liberal Party told me so just a few years ago. What do we hear from him about climate? John Howard came out four years after he spoke, after he left office and made the foreword and made the annual lecture for the Global Warming Policy Foundation. Skeptic. He says he's agnostic, meaning he doesn't have a view either way. So why the hell did he put in a renewable energy target? Why the hell did he advocate the first emissions trading scheme? Why the hell did he steal farmers' property rights in order to comply with Kyoto? Why did he cons conspire with Peter Beatty and Bob Carr in this state to steal farmers' property rights without paying compensation? It's that. But beyond that, it's godlessness. Because they won't speak up. They're afraid of the media. That is only something we can stop. We've got to keep speaking up. Everyone in this room. My only comment, and having a finance background, and I tend to look into things that are stealth, that are under the surface, that nobody's talking about, which was what we did with the same-sex marriage and the safe school program and the loss of religious freedoms. Sharia finance. Yes. No one's talking about it. Uh, what is it? There's no protest. And may I also infringe on you, Liberal Party Conservatives, your Liberal Party members in Parliament, your Conservatives, haven't said anything about it, but actually voted for it. I have put the question to a couple of Conservatives, uh, members of Parliament and Liberal Party, saying how could you possibly have allowed that to happen. They didn't have an answer. So I put it back to you, the people, need to make some noise because that's only the beginning. And it's again, stealth. It's not being talked about. Uh, last week in the Australian, uh, my name is Peter Bruin, by the way, some of you know me. Um, I've been involved with the H.S. Chapman Society on electoral matters. Um, a, senator, a former senator and minister, Richard Alston, uh, was reported as, and, 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 and now federal president of the Liberal Party, was now um, reported as saying that um, foreign uh, donations to uh, political parties was good. <laughs> now, I will ask you, is your party going to ban foreign donations? I don't think any big business should be donating any money. I've spoken to people that have said they've received, they've seen checks between major banks and political politicians pass hands over lunch. So, no, I don't think political parties should be controlled by any big business. It should be controlled by the people. So how does CDP do it? Honestly, $5, $20 by absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous people that believe in our uh, policies, that believe in the good work that Paul Green and Fred Nile have done over the years. And it's their generosity of time and their small change that has kept the party going for 35 years. And that's our view. Now, that's, you're still 
program and everything else, and you haven't mentioned how it's emanated out of the United Nations rights of the child. People should see it's a YouTube video called The International War on Children that the video gives you a real insight on what the agenda is. The Agenda 21 has been replaced by, it's now called the, uh, yes, it's called the Sustainable Development Agenda 2030. I was with, at a conference over the weekend and I actually met one of the ladies that worked in the United Nations. I won't sort of mention her name. And she said that all 196 nations have signed this document. It is why you see the same policies, the same issues go from country to country to country to country. And it is why you are seeing a wave, again, of the anti-main parties, because people like you, people like us, are awake to these things. And so that is what you see with uh, those agendas. So with the uh, International War on Children, what you'll find in there is that there are small countries that have been told that if you do not uh, provide education on this safe school, and it's called different things in different countries, we will cut off your foreign aid. That's the kind of thing that they're doing. Now, I do want to dispel, if I may, have a couple of minutes, this, this, myth, this myth of this opt-in, opt-out for Safe School Program. You cannot opt-in and opt-out. Why? Because it is like a virus throughout the curriculum. So this opt-in, opt-out is an absolute myth. Ask any principal, ask any teacher, that you want your child to opt out of this uh, safe school program and they will be unable to give you an answer. That is why the, it is so insidious. So my other issue is the change to the marriage act, the safe school program, the loss of religious freedoms, the, the strengthening of the anti-discrimination anti act. Perry, Penny Wong saying that she wants an LGBTI commission at $1.4 million to police these loss of freedoms. That is what it's about. You get one, you get the change in the same in the marriage act, you will get the other two. Make no mistakes, they all follow on. I'm actually going to ask it of Malcolm, but it's applicable to all of them. That's just what I just want to I'm a former One Nation member and I was a candidate in 2013 for the seat of Werriwa. I'm now an ALA member. In 2009 this year, in, in this state, I took a case against an Islamic school, the Malikbe, an Islamic school, and AFIC on their rorting of our funding. It's still in the courts and we're about to go to the High Court. We've filed for the High Court. About six months ago, my young daughter, she's 22, ran into a school friend of hers and said to him, oh, what are you doing now? He says, I run a childcare centre. <laughs> my daughter says, oh, good, can I come and work for you? Because I'm a childcare um, employee and I'm looking for a job. Three weeks ago, that was the $28 million rort of the 22 and 26-year-old Childcare workers, they have absconded overseas to Islamic countries for $28 million of our money. Malik Fayyid have pocketed $178 million of our money, half of which has gone to APIC, which is promoting Islam around our country because Malik Fayyid pay rent to APIC, APIC uses that money, buys another property, rents it to the next school, and it builds and builds and builds. What can either of the parties, Free Knowles being involved, ALA know a little bit about it, and Pauline knows quite a bit, what can you do for us in the Senate to stop all of our money going offshore? Thank you for the question.
Um, we can ask questions, but sometimes asking questions from the Senate floor is just um, is just icing. But we can also, no, it's not really icing, it's window dressing. We can also ask questions of ministers if, we, if we're fully informed. And we're developing a reputation in Parliament for asking hard questions and getting things done. And the Liberals and the Nats in particular can see it that we're genuine. And so they're willing to deal with us. And they're, they're becoming very cooperative. And um, so you can send us the information. Brian Burston's your Senator for Queensland, uh, for New South Wales. And um, if Pauline already knows, the, already knows the information, then we can ask questions behind the scenes of ministers and find out what's going on. But the bigger thing we can do is increase accountability in general, because those are symptomatic of low accountability. And the other thing we can do is we can keep talking about Islam. And the other thing we can do is we can keep talking about our um, welfare card, the Australia card, the Pauline's uh, pushing. Tony Abbott's showing interest in that. Simon Birmingham pulled the funding, but it's now being restored. And it shouldn't be. <laughs> um, I've had dealings with Simon Birmingham when he was minister for... Uh, what was he? he was assistant minister, assistant to the, to the Minister for Climate Change, uh, Minister of the Environment, Greg Hunt, mm -hmm. sending lots of information um, in a nicely packaged format that showed that there's no, there's no basis for climate change policies. Just ignore that. Found it way into the circular filing cabinet at the edge of his desk. Yes, they have a very, some of them have a very clever way of escaping accountability, but we haven't finished. So, um, but just a couple of comments on that. I mentioned that Peter a minute ago. He, he's aware of it. If you look at the two fundamental building blocks of our society, they're the family and they're the nation state. Mm -hmm. Now, in our country, our constitution is set up so we have sovereign states and a federation of sovereign states. So the state, I believe, the, the, the states like New South Wales, Queensland, they're fundamental to the proper running of this country. Our constitution has been deliberately designed to stop a central government. Deliberately designed to stop a central government. And it has failed. Because we now have more than 50% of, of state expenditure. It comes from the federal government and is controlled by the federal government. So that does several things. It gives central bureaucrats the power. So we have a central government. It also means we've got to have bureaucrats in Canberra and bureaucrats in Sydney, doubling the cost. Can you see what I'm getting at? By destroying the family, you destroy the basis of welfare and destroy the identity. When you destroy family, where do people run? Government. Central government. Uh, my name is Rosemary Lavery, and um, I did come here tonight to see Senator Brian Burston speak, but I will forgive him, he's obviously not well. Um, now, it, what I'm about to say, it, it's perhaps not really a question, but I just wanted to say, uh, although anyone can answer if, if they like or if they're aware of this, but um, at the moment I'm in the middle of writing a letter to my federal member, who is John Alexander. And to put the fear of God into him, I put a CC, one nation. <laughs> and the reason I've done that, um, I've been watching the ABC, Late Line and Q&A, and there was a young lady there, and you'll have to forgive me, I really cannot pronounce her surname. Um, that's probably my fault, but I, I just can't remember. I, I have it in writing at home. Uh, but she made a statement in both of those shows that there were 800,000 to a million people coming into Australia via our airports as and settling here uh, under an immigration system. Now, I was not aware that that was the number, so I did ring John Alexander's office and for one of the first times ever, they asked me to put something in writing. So I, I'm... I'm, I'm going to take that up and hand deliver it just to make sure it gets to them. But uh, I'm just wondering if any uh, of our speakers know about this. We have to limit this to one, one yeah. speaker because of, oh, the, well, because of the lineup. All of right that. then. Um, I, have, I have no problem whichever person wants to answer this, but I don't know if anyone 
uh, who spoke tonight is aware of that, but it does concern me slightly. That's a lot more than I had um, been led to believe, so it means we're being lied to. Thank you. Thank you. Could, could you just repeat the core of your question, please? I didn't understand it. Oh, basically, it's about uh, this 800,000 to 1 million people coming through our airports each year, and she said for the last four years, and they're being settled here uh, and in Australia mm -hmm. under our immigration system. Now, that's not the figure that we're being told. No, I, mean, uh, I, I can't confirm off the top of my head what, what that is. I found it okay. interesting, you know, what, what have they made up of? If, if you don't find out from John Alexander, he's your rep, so let him do the job. If you don't get satisfaction from him, because he should be able to get direct access to the Immigration Minister, and that's a simple question, deserves a simple answer. If you don't, then contact Brian, because he, he'd like to handle that topic. Oh, well, I, I want to send him a copy anyway. Yep. Uh, my name is Peter Stitt. Uh, I'm uh, a mining and geologic consultant, also been a member of a Pioneer Green Group for 66 years. I'd like to make two points to Malcolm uh, concerning global warming and uh, unreliables or unrenewables. Unre uh, global warming, it seems to me that we the rationalists get bogged down in the minutiae of the debate and we ought to take a leaf from the book of the eco loons uh, and just hammer one point. Their one point is the science is settled I think we should be hammering the point that as much as anything is ever settled in science, the only things that are settled are their fundamental propositions are lies. Their fundamental propositions are one, man is the cause of global warming, and two, the rates of warming are unprecedented. Both of them are lies. The oceans have been going up and down 105, 130 metres on a 100,000 year cycle for the eight, last 800,000 years. Man's obviously had nothing to do with that. The rates of rise coming into this empty glacial, where the oceans came up to 120 metres, were about 10 million litres a year, over five times the current rate. So both the fundamental propositions are lies. I think we just keep on focusing on that and focus on it and focus on it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> unreliable. Uh, look, I agree with everything that Malcolm's been saying, but I think there's one point that could possibly be made to poke in the eye of the other side when they bleed on about 100% renewables. Now, the whole, thing, the whole thing's ridiculous, renewables, but 100% renewables, the people who bleat about it are the people who've made it impossible because the only technology which allows it to happen is pump storage. And they've locked up every pump storage site on the east coast of Australia and dams. So why don't you have me that one a bit, Malcolm? <laughs> Thank you. You're, you're absolutely right, Peter, on, on both points. The, the first point, um, we do focus on one, one thing on climate. It's take, taken us quite a while to, to recognise that. We focus on one thing. Please show me the empirical evidence that human production of carbon dioxide is affecting climate. That's it. The core of science, what, what is so beautiful about science, the heart of science, is that it's decided by empirical evidence. Now, empirical simply means measured data, hard facts, physical observations. That's all. It's basic. It's fundamental. They've never presented any, and they can't, because the actual data shows the reverse of what they're claiming. So you know that. So we, I can re reassure you that we are focusing on that. Journalists running away to their dictionary after my first press conference looking for the word, uh, meaning of the word empirical. Some people said, don't use the word empirical because they don't understand. No, 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 we will keep using it. It's now being used by people in America. It's being used increasingly. The Greens and the ALP, when I stand up, make fun of me and say, where's your empirical evidence? Great. You should have asked them, where's the brain? So that's, <laughs> so that's the first thing. I won't go into the details on what the evidence shows because you can see me afterwards. But um, the second thing on renewables, the alternatives to energy, is that hydro is classified as a renewable. And when you see renewable energy being more than just 1% or 2%, it's usually due to hydro. 
We have got abundant water in the north, Western Australia and Queensland, abundant water. We could irrigate the inland, we can irrigate many areas of this, this country, we can also generate hydroelectricity. But there's no need to go away from coal. I know, look. But hydro is cheaper. It's the cheapest form of energy there is. But the renewables cause enormous damage to reliability of electricity supply, to price of electricity supply, and to, and to security of electricity supply. And the figures show that if you look at the life cycle from the start of construction of a wind farm to the ending of the wind farm, it creates more carbon dioxide than it saves. And that is because it has to be, because it takes more energy than it actually produces. And that's why it costs so much, because it costs more than it actually earns. It's dumb. It's, sorry, it's dishonest, because people are doing that without, it, without any thought. Think about this one. Greg Hombay, in 2007, resigned as Secretary of the ACTU around about June. Uh, sorry, no, uh, that's when he resigned from the Union Industry Superannuation Fund. I forgot the exact name of it. It was the largest, it was the owner of the largest wind farm company in the country, Pacific Hydro. A foreign journalist exposed this. So he resigned as director. A few months later, he was parachuted from Victoria into a safe seat in the Hunter Valley, the seat of Charlton, I think it was. He then became a, a member of parliament, along with Kevin Rudd's election of victory in, as prime minister. He then became an assistant minister, minister very quickly. He later went on to become the climate change minister. He introduced the Julie Gillard's carbon tax lie. When he did that, he also sent out renewable money to renewables. He shoveled tens of millions of dollars into Pacific Hydro, taxpayer funded. See the connection? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's done. And, and, and wind farms get money under many contracts, no matter how much energy they produce. And when storms come, and they have to shut them down because they can't, affect, can't handle the high winds, who's going to give you power? All it does is add capital costs. And you have to have a coal-fired power station generating baseload. You're adding costs and getting nothing except unreliability because it destroys the reliability of the power generation grid. It is stupid and it's dishonest. Okay, name is Victor Waters and I was ex One Nation as well. I'm now in Australia first. I ran in the last federal election in the seat of McMahon. I did next to nothing. I got 2.1% of the vote. Um, now, in you know, the lead up to my question, um, you know, this has all been about um, the rise of the minor political parties. One in three people apparently voted for them. That, that therefore means two-thirds of the people in this room voted for Labor and Liberal. Shame on you. Um, anyway, <clears throat> back in 1901 when we federated, they were very smart back then, they gave us a policy called the Immigration Restriction Act, commonly called the White Australia Policy. What made Pauline famous or notorious was her maiden speech about Australia's being swamped by Asians. Pauline today has made the statement that anybody of any nationality, colour or whatever can now be an Australian. I believe in your opening statement as well, you've made similar sort of claims. Do you still stand by the idea that anybody, any nationality and any race can be an Australian? Thank you. A couple of uh, misconceptions that people have reported about Pauline's statement. She didn't say we are being we are being swamped by Asians in 1998. She didn't say we are being swamped by Muslims now. She said we are in danger of being swamped. Five paragraphs below in her maiden speech, which John has a copy of here, uh, it says that she welcomes the Asians who have settled and integrated into our country. That's what she said in 1998. And she welcomes... She welcomes, and I welcome, anybody from any background who is willing, as I think one of the ladies over there said, is willing to integrate. That's the test. And for too long, we've been talking about numbers in immigration. We should be talking about quality of immigration. Quality being their, their willingness to fit into our culture. Because it's very important, as Brian Burston said, he got the facts from Frank Salter 
who's an academic who's done the research, and, and he said that diversity actually causes problems. And we understand that. We've seen it now. Yes, but once someone comes here, then and they make the effort to integrate, then I believe they should be welcomed and treated as Australians. This one might be a bit upsetting, Doctor. Uh, why are, are there, um, I understand, 14,000 soldiers to be stationed at Townsville sometime this year? Can you explain that? Or have you heard it? Well, it doesn't matter, it's Australia. <laughs> Singapore. What are they saying? Oh, sorry. Singapore. Now, the question was about Singaporean soldiers, and um, I haven't heard that, to be honest with you, but I know there's uh, a contingent of uh, US Marines in Darwin at the moment, and uh, that's a little bit of uh, power balancing from the Americans. To, uh, I guess it's probably to offset the Chinese who own the docks now in uh, Darwin. But, <laughs> General's got a question? Hang on. Oh. Hang on. You're still answering. Okay, that's all right. Uh, I thought you were going to correct something I was going to say. No, no. Um, Townsville is actually quite a large military establishment in its own right. It's a bit like Holsworthy in, in uh, some ways. I actually served in Townsville for a few years back in the early 70s, and it's uh, now nothing like what it used to be in my time. It's a much larger military establishment. And in fact, it dates back to World War II when a lot of the area of um, uh, Healy and Vincent, uh, now suburbs of, uh, of Townsville, was in fact um, a US military runway for their air base there, of which now the Garbutt RAAF base is a shadow of its former self. So uh, I wasn't aware of Singaporean soldiers being stationed in Darwin or Townsville. I'm not surprised by it. Singapore is a very clever country, and this is going to be a bit off topic a little bit. In all the years, I remember I used to be a Chinese interpreter um, back in the day, and um, we could never go to Singapore to practice Mandarin because Mandarin was seen as the communist language that was practiced in China. And Lee Kuan Yew basically said, no, we'll never foster um, Mandarin in Singapore. Anyway, what a lot of people don't realize is that what his soldiers were doing at the same time was they would dress in their civilian clothes and they'd go to the airport in Singapore and jump in an aeroplane and they'd fly to Hainan Island in China. They'd get off the aircraft and they'd go into the locker rooms and change into their Singapore Army uniforms and there'd be Singapore Army armoured vehicles and trucks and everything sitting outside and they would conduct military exercises in Hainan Island because it was a much larger place than Singapore and it gave them the opportunity to... Uh, train in areas they couldn't train in their native Singapore or through one of their alliance countries like Australia. So <clears throat> all the time there was this two-faced approach, I guess. And um, I was going to give you some compensation to say, no, there's a reason why a lot of women aren't in politics is because they don't want to put makeup on two faces in the morning. <laughs> but <laughs> anyway, that, I'm not going to say that now. But... Um, so I'm not surprised that the Singaporeans are stationing troops here. It's all part of what we used to call ASEAN and a lot of the uh, alliances that are made um, unilaterally around um, defence and defence cooperation. And it's a, you know, the biggest threat to Australian security is domestic terrorism. You don't fight domestic terrorism with submarines or strike fighters. So the federal government's throwing tens of billions of dollars into things that will probably never be used. I thought they would invite people to find That's the hidden agenda. <laughs> South Australia again. Right, my question is to Senator Roberts. Um, my name is Richard Smolensky. I'm a former Customs and Border Protection Officer for 32 years. Um, the son of a political refugee who came out of war torn Poland and was killed on the Snowy Mountain Scheme. So my question is going to be specific. You've outlined the major parts of our problems, Senator, and others have here too. Given that tax and other things are, are an important part of where our country's future is, and that um, the appalling reach of the UN, how do we get back to um, nation building, which we saw from the Snowy Mountain Scheme, and what it gave us as a basis of a nation in capacity of manufacturing of power and building, and how do we also correct um, the same 
pathway from the abolishment of customs in 2015, which now removes the controls we had on our border and fast tracks the UN's reach into our country. There is two parts to that, and I, I, but I wanted to give both examples because I think they are both critical to our country's future, um, including um, the rise of small parties to defend our freedoms. But, The infrastructure is, um, question is, is crucial. I agree with you, Richard. The, um, the infrastructure that we live off right now, from what I'm told reliably by John McRae, it was built sometimes in the 1920s and 1930s. There's a big bridge just outside that was built in the 1930s. And, and John tells me all the railway in, in Sydney underground built in the, in the 1920s. So, um, one of the things that we had back in 1911 was uh, the Fisher Labor government passed the Commonwealth Bank uh, legislation and put in place the People's Bank, the Commonwealth Bank. It was also the Central Bank, the uh, Reserve Bank, and it performed wonderfully and it made cheap loans to, to um, enterprises. It developed a lot of the infrastructure, developed some, I think, ships that enabled our, our um, export of cotton, uh, sorry, wool to um, Europe and London and it did a marvellous job. What's happened is that the banks have been, the, the currency has been taken over by private banks. So what happens is that there are two ways of issuing a government issuing money. It can just issue it and pay for infrastructure at the same time, which makes sense. Or it can borrow it from a private bank that has issued it. Because when you, issue, when you make a, de a loan, that's issuing currency. So just even a loan is issuing currency. So what we're doing is we're paying someone interest when we could be just doing it for nothing. Yes. It's dumb. Yes. The but people don't talk about that very much. The second question, so that's infrastructure. Uh, what was your second question? The abolishment of customs and fast tracks the United Nations reach and the transnationals reach into our country because oh. we have no yeah, I don't know much about that to be able to speak and I tend not to speak about things that I don't know much about and I'm a politician that's uh, not afraid to say I don't know about that one. I suggest you talk to the guy next to you. He's got the answer. Well, I'm telling you, no, 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 I'm sorry, no. Now look, the, the next question is going to be the last question and I mean quick because we have to get out in 10 minutes. I believe in the 10 minute rule, this will take 9 minutes. No, no, no. <laughs> Five minutes then. We've had a very entertaining time, everybody, and it's a hurrah for free speech. I think that's what we need here. Now, I don't believe in centering with anybody, and the hardest thing that the world's facing at the moment is the loss of the center. We're all centered, but unfortunately, the center is losing out, and that's why I think some of the speakers that we've had tonight will agree with me that the minor parties throughout the world are those parties which are against what has become the old right and left. We've seen it in, in the States. We see it in Europe. Um, if anything, I might found the Pirate Party because I noticed there's the one idea that's missing here that's very popular in Germany and other places. What they do, wearing eye patches, I have no idea. But what we have here is not a, a country. It is a continent, the only continent ruled by one country. And it's six countries, and if it's my way, I'd get Northern Territory to be merged with North Queensland, which recently wanted to secede, and was forbidden to do that by Brisbane. I do believe in regionalism. I do believe that everybody should have a say, and I'm sure that all our speakers here do, because what we have is someone and others standing here for the little person in the crowd, in the provinces, in manufacturing. And this is my question. We've seen the death of Australian manufacturing like we've never seen before. When I came here in 64, it was buy your holding, pies and kangaroos, Fords, Chryslers, all existed and people had and pride in the local manufacturing. We've now seen the demise, as it was mentioned by Malcolm, of the aluminium smelters that Malcolm Fraser's government had because of the ability of having very inexpensive energy. Now, unfortunately, our energy costs are going to be a lot more expensive. 
for various reasons I've been outlined already. My question is, now that the death of manufacturing has occurred and we're going to rely on big holes in the ground to pay our way in the world, most of it which is siphoned off through particularly good financial engineering via Singapore and other places, Actually, so that Australia doesn't get say, those taxes. We have to say good night. Right? So no, I just wanted to give from that question, okay? Thank you. Who answered the question? One person. The lady. Yes, yes, yes. No, no. Yeah. no, thank you. I thought it might be a good opportunity to give everybody an update of actually what's happening in um, here in the state. Uh, not long ago, actually just a few weeks ago, the Christian Democratic Party, Paul Green, made an announcement. He and the other minor parties were able to pass legislation that only Australian steel will be used. So we are certainly involved in that. Uh, Fred and Paul are very much for Australian manufacturing, for Australian industry, and that was a step forward to ensure that this nonsense about importing steel, uh, when we have our own uh, steel manufacturing here in, in the south coast that was about to be closed, uh, it's just a farce. And so we have been very instrumental with the other, other um, minor parties to ensure that it Australian steel will be used. The other thing I have is my family owns a manufacturing company. Um, it was opened 50 years ago and it almost closed down and I said to my sister, if you don't buy it, I will. So she, of course she bought it. And they uh, were part of the Ford, Holland and Toyota. They were, uh, they just won last year actually, they won a manufacturing award, a supply award from Holden. Um, a worldwide award. So that's a good story and what they've done now is they've had to diversify uh, into other areas because the car manufacturing industry is just about gone which is very very sad and so they've just gone overseas to bring over some new equipment uh, and new technology so I do want to encourage you there are manufacturing companies still out there and my family is one of them and so I encourage you to support them, find out who they are. And what's amazing to me was I tried to ring a Liberal politician to come in and say, hey, come and have a look at what's happening here, and never heard back from him. He was just not interested in how this small company that was about to go broke that was purchased by my family had now turned around and was doing much, much better. So there seems to be some... Uh, I don't know, bias against small, small business out there in the, in the major parties. So I do want to encourage you, stick with um, Paul and Fred. They're, they're doing some things there in the Australian industry. Thank you.